Each cylinder has a mass of 50 kilograms. The radius of each is 300 millimeters, and I want to have three of the coefficients of static friction be 0.5 at A, B, and C, and the, sixth, the fourth one be 0.6 at D. What I want to know is, how big of M do I need to spin the right cylinder? Nothing is asked for in the question about the left-hand cylinder. So the first thing I want to do are my free body diagrams. Start with the one where you know what's happening. So I know that there's going to be a moment over here on this right-hand cylinder. I know that the weight of that cylinder is 490.5 newtons. Remember, this is in kilograms. And you always want to get rid of a kilogram by multiplying it by gravity. So I've got this radius of 0 0.3 meters, and I want to find out what's going on. As I draw a free body diagram in this right cylinder, I have taken away two supports, the floor and the left cylinder. The floor is going to have a normal force. We're going to call that NC because it's the normal force at C, and a friction force. To figure out which way the friction force is, you have to ask yourself, how would it move in the absence of friction? So in the absence of friction, this is going to spin counterclockwise, which means this point down here at C is going to want to move to the right. So friction is acting to the left. Same thing at D. Remember that even if, no matter what happens with that left-hand cylinder, there's still a normal force from this, from the cylinder. The right-hand ball can't all of a sudden translate to the left without there being a resistance there. That resistance has to go on your free body diagram as the normal force. Also, if this cylinder starts spinning counterclockwise, there's going to be a resistance at point D here. Point D would be, if it were spinning, traveling down. So I have FD going up. On the other side, and this is very important. Point D is on both of your free body diagrams. So whatever you put on one of them has to be equal and opposite on the other. So FD is going up. That means that there must be an equal and opposite force FD on this side going down and an equal and opposite force going to the left. Don't put negative signs on those. Those are the actual same magnitudes. So if, for example, if you solved your equilibrium and the ND on the right-hand cylinder was actually pointing to the left, then this one would be actually pointing to the right, and you would have the same negatives. So you don't want any negatives on your free body diagrams. Now I have the same weight, and I have the same radius. I'm clearly removing the floor, so I'm going to have normal forces at the floor, and I'm removing the wall. I have a normal force at the wall. Now I'll also have friction forces at the wall and the floor. How are these friction forces going to go? Well, in the absence of everything else, just looking at the free body diagram on the left, the force, the only force that would tend to move points A and B comes from the friction, F sub D. So if this cylinder rotates, it's going to want to rotate clockwise. Think about this as two gears that are meshing. If they both spin, the right one goes counterclockwise, then the left one goes clockwise. So point A would want to move up. That means the friction at A has to point down. Point B would want to move to the left. That means the friction at point B has to move to the right. That's our free body diagrams. The second thing I want to do is write the equations of equilibrium for both of my cylinders. I am not, at this point, assuming that anything's slipping or not. All I've got is the every possible force and the direction it goes in, and I write, and write down the equations of equilibrium that are going to hold no matter what happens. So if I start on the left disk, with the sum of the forces in the x direction, I get ND equals NA plus FB. For the sum of the forces in the y direction, I have NB equals FA plus FD plus W. And for the sum of the moments, I'm going to take my moments about the center point of this disk because all three normal forces and the weight act through the line, have lines of action that pass through the center of the disk. So all I will have is FA times the radius, FB times the radius, and both of those are tending to oppose the motion, and FD which causes the motion at 0 0.3 as well. So FA plus FB has to equal FD. On my right hand cylinder I have, for the sum of the forces in the x direction, ND equals FC, NC plus FD equals the weight, and the moment, my applied load, is going to be FC times the radius 0 0.3 plus FD times the radius 0 0.3. Now you want to know what M does it take to spin the right cylinder. I want to know what's happening here. I must have impending motion at C. There's no other choice. That has to be. D is going to be open to debate. I don't know whether that left-hand cylinder is spinning or not, but I know that motion is impending at C. So 
What does that mean? Motion impending at C tells me that FC is going to be equal to the static coefficient of friction times the normal force there. That's what I want. I want the M I need to spin this right cylinder. So FC equals 0.5 times NC. I'm going to plug that into the equations of equilibrium for the right-hand disk. That gives me ND is 0.5 NC. NC plus FD equals the weight. And the moment is 0.3 times 0.5 is 0.15 NC plus 0.3 times FD. I have too many unknowns. Just for this, considering just the right-hand cylinder, I have four unknowns. ND, NC, FD, and M. I can't solve three equations in four unknowns, so I need to make another assumption. Unfortunately, at this point, there's not actually an assumption that you can be absolutely sure is true. So what we can say is either the left-hand cylinder spins or it doesn't. We've assumed that the right-hand cylinder slips at C, but we have not made any assumption yet about the point D. In fact, you don't know whether the left-hand cylinder is going to spin or whether it's not going to make it going to spin. We can consider both of the cases, since either it's going to spin or it's not going to spin. If it doesn't spin, then you can say this then actually slips at D. You have impending motion not only at C, but also at D. FD is equal to 0.6 times ND. That would give me a fourth equation for my four unknowns. If it doesn't, if the left-hand cylinder does not turn, if it slips at both C and D, then I end up with ND equals 0.5 times NC. Some of the forces in Y tells me NC plus 0.6 times ND equals 490.5. That's my weight. Now, substituting one into the other, NC plus 0.6 times 0.5 times NC equals 490.5. That lets me solve NC is 377.31 newtons. I can plug that into the sum of the moments. M is equal to 0.15 times 377.31 plus 0.3 times 0.6 times 0.5 times 377.31 gives me M is 90.554 newton meters. That is the moment that I'm going to need to spin the right-hand cylinder if the left-hand cylinder doesn't spin. Now, I don't know that whether the left-hand cylinder spins or not, so I have to go back and consider my other column. If the left-hand cylinder does not slip, the left-hand cylinder spins, it does not slip at D, then I can no longer assume that FD equals 0.6 times ND. I, at this point, can't even solve either cylinder independently. I have to consider all of my equations of equilibrium. Now, what I can say, though, while I can't consider what's happening at D, I can say that the left cylinder, if it spins, has to slip at both A and B. Since there's no way for it to slip at only one and still be a cylinder, both of those have to be the case, not FD, but A and B have to be the same. So if I consider the equilibrium for my right-hand cylinder, I get ND is 0.5 NC, and NC is my 490.5 minus FD. I can solve one for the other and plug it in, and down here I'm going to write ND is equal to 0.5 times 490.5 minus FD. That's the information I have from my right cylinder. The equation for the moment isn't going to help me because that just adds yet another unknown. So this, is, this comes from my right cylinder. Now let's look at what I have for my left cylinder, assuming that it slips at both places. Now I have ND is NA plus 0.5 NB, which I can solve for NB. NB is 2 ND minus 2 NA. Some of the forces in Y says NB is 0 0.5 times NA because it slips there, plus FD plus 490.5. I want to substitute this one into there. That gives me 2 ND minus 2 NA equals 0.5 NA plus FD plus 490.5. This is the sum of the forces in X and Y for the left-hand cylinder. The last equation I have to deal with, of course, is the sum of the moments for the left-hand cylinder. That gives me 0.3 times 0.5 NA plus 
0.3 times 0.5 NB equals 0.3 times FD. I can't do this one, remember, because we've assumed it doesn't slip at D. Let's solve this equation for ND. If I do that, I get ND is 1.25 NA plus 0.5 FD plus 245.25. If I substitute this one in for that, since I've solved two different equations for ND, I can set them equal. I've got 0 0.5, 490.5 minus FD equals 1.25 NA plus 0.5 FB plus 245.25. If you solve that for NA, you get NA equals negative 0.8 FD, which is already starting to raise alarm bells with you. To get your normal force equal to a negative friction force means that one of the directions on your free body diagram is incorrect. Either NA is going to be pulling to the left, which means somehow you've hooked your left hand cylinder at the wall instead of just having it pushing against the wall, or your friction force here on the left cylinder is pushing up, which doesn't make a lot of sense either, given where we've applied a moment. But pressing on, if that's insufficient evidence for you, we can solve NB equals, if I plug that in to what I had before, NB equals 2ND minus 2 times negative 0.8 FD. That just plugs back into this one. And then I can substitute them all into the sum of the moments, and I get 0.15 negative 0.8 FD plus 0.15 2ND plus 1.6 FD equals 0.3 FD or 0.3 ND equals 0.18 FD, which gives you the lovely equation FD equals 1.67 ND. The friction force is 1.67 times the normal force. Now, maximum friction force is 0.6 times ND for D. This and this can't both be the same. This is a contradiction. Whenever you make an assumption, remember I said either the left-hand cylinder spins, or it doesn't. When it didn't spin, I got an answer, but I wasn't sure it was right, because there was also the possibility that it did not slip at D. But when I went to consider what happens if it does not slip at D, I get a contradiction. So I can be very sure that this whole case is incorrect. That cannot happen, because it leads to a contradiction with my equations of equilibrium. So I can say with authority, that it must slip at D. And the answer to my question is, the moment needed to turn the right-hand cylinder is 90.6 Newton meters.